the app of OMFIV. I wish you all a warm welcome to our virtual roundtable on Hong Kong's future as an international financial center. Today we are joined by ADU, Chief Executive at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and Mark Burgess, Asia Chairman at OMFIV. There will be an on-the-record discussion, which will be streamed on our OMFIV live webpage and can be later viewed on our on-demand webpage. We will begin with an opening remark from Mark and with a presentation by Mr. Yu. We will then move on to a discussion between Mr. Mark and Mr. Yu. And in the later part of the discussion, we'll delve into the questions that have been sent in by yourself. So please send your question throughout the session through our Slido chat box on our own Live live webpage. We hope that you will enjoy the session. Mark. Thanks very much, Diana, um, who's based, I think, in London. And I'm Mark Burgess. I'm based in Melbourne in Australia, and I'm chairman of uh, uh, Asia for OMFIF. Uh, my background is previously running the Future Fund down here, the Sovereign Fund, but also in financial services generally, particularly on the asset owner side. Um, just in terms of today's uh, presentation, I'd like to thank uh, Eddie Yu for uh, being available to talk to OMFIF, always been helpful in our debates and discussions. Um, but I, I know the audience is probably not aware of who else is on the line. It's one of the downsides of not meeting together. Uh, but we have a really wide spread of people who've joined us today. We're expecting over 100. Um, but across things like uh, universities, regulators, asset owners, investment bankers, uh, um, we've got a real variety um, of people and, uh, and also geographies. We've got a lot of people across Europe, a lot of people in the region. And I think this is really indicative of, of people's um, you know, desire to understand Hong Kong, know where Hong Kong's at, uh, but also knowing that the long-term growth rates for Hong Kong and the region are going to be significant uh, issues, uh, positive issues, I think, for, um, you know, global investors, for all of us uh, looking forward. And I think it's absolutely fantastic, uh, Eddie, uh, for you to speak to us today. Um, but I'd also like to just thank you more broadly. Um, anybody who does any research on HKMA knows that you're very open, very transparent, um, very willing to discuss the issues that uh, that Hong Kong is facing, but also to explain to us, you know, the fabulous potential growth rates, et cetera, um, that the region will have. So on that uh, positive note, I'll perhaps hand over to you, Eddie. I think you've got a few comments to make and then we'll have questions. As Diana mentioned, uh, please send through your questions to us. Uh, we're very keen to do that in the back half of the presentation. But uh, once again, thank you very much, Eddie, and I'll just hand over to you. To, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and uh, thanks again for organizing this webinar. Uh, and I'm really pleased that there is a wide spectrum of people attending this webinar uh, so that we can interact in a, in a, in, in a good way so that uh, you will know more about Hong Kong. Uh, let me start by uh, talking a little about uh, what Hong Kong has been through in the last few years and uh, also how the financial system uh, has been faring in the last two years. Uh, and then I'll talk about the opportunity set uh, that we see in the next few years. Uh, as you all know, uh, the last two years, uh, it, there's been quite a lot of challenges for Hong Kong. But all through those challenges, whether you're talking about the social unrest, up to COVID, up to the uh, China-US relationship, uh, the financial system of Hong Kong has remained remarkably resilient and stable. Uh, if you look at the exchange rate, uh, it's always been lingering on the strong side. Uh, and in fact, just last year, uh, we've seen inflows into the Hong Kong dollar, not outflows, it's inflows into Hong Kong dollars by the amount of about 50 billion US dollars. Uh, and this actually, um, there, are, there are two reasons for that. One is attributed uh, to the quite vibrant equities and IPO market. But the other is also about the confidence in the Hong Kong dollar pack. Uh, and there's not been any you know, speculative positions that we've seen in the market that's built up against Hong Kong dollar. We have not really heard a lot of rumors sort of trying to speculate whether the, the, the link will stay. People just assume that there won't be any change to the Hong Kong dollar link and that monetary stability will be here to stay. The same story with deposits. Uh, you know, one will think that with all that's been going on in Hong Kong in the last few years, there will be outflows in our deposit base. But instead, we actually saw uh, quite good inflows or growth of our deposit base uh, in the last uh, two years. In 2019 and 2020 together, uh, the total deposits in Hong Kong grew by 8.3%, which is quite a lot given the size of Hong Kong's banking system. And uh, for this year, the trend continues. Uh, for the first half, the growth was about 4, four to 5%. Uh, 
Um, so it's been um, actually uh, quite well in terms of the exchange rate uh, and the deposit uh, base. The same with the capital markets. I'm sure that you, you are all well aware of the vibrant uh, IPO market in Hong Kong, uh, ranking second in 2020 uh, in the world. Uh, and in coming into the six, first, six, first half of this year, uh, IPO continues to be quite strong, uh, which is about half of the total amounts of last year. Uh, and uh, as a management, uh, private wealth uh, uh, management uh, also continue to grow. Uh, again, this is an area that people are expecting, hey, if you were a high net worth individual, will you continue to invest through Hong Kong or put your money here? The fact is that uh, in 2019, the asset under management in Hong Kong, which mostly come from uh, international uh, wealth, the asset under management in Hong Kong grew by 19% in 2019, when Hong Kong was going through the most in terms of instability. And just last year, 2020, this uh, asset at under management figure grew by another 25%. So you can see how sort of in terms of the financial sector, how robust and vibrant uh, it is uh, as contrasted to the other developments uh, in Hong Kong. So by and large, I would say that um, we have maintained a very stable uh, uh, environment uh, in Hong Kong in terms of financial stability. But it's not just stability that we need to look at. We also need to think about development at the same time. We need to think about creating opportunities for the financial sector who are based here. Because after all, an international financial center is really about having the right ecosystem and having the right set of opportunities. Now, let me talk a little about the opportunities that we see uh, for our financial sector in the next few, uh, next few years. Uh, it can be neatly summed up in just three words, China, technology, and green. And in terms of China, I'm actually more talking about connecting China uh, and the international financial markets. And Hong Kong is very unique in performing this role. We have always been a gateway to China. And Hong Kong is unique in the sense that we are part of China, yet we are fully integrated into the international financial system. Uh, and we've seen this journey of connecting China and the global markets uh, through the uh, creation of the Stock Connect some years ago, uh, and then the Bond Connect North Bank. Uh, and very shortly, this what we call the Connect family uh, will be extended to include uh, two uh, new Connect schemes. One is the Bank Connect South Bank, meaning that uh, when the scheme is launched, uh, mainland institutional investors will be able to invest through the Hong Kong platform to the global bonds and also bonds issued in Hong Kong. It's the first time that institutional money is allowed to flow out to invest in global bonds. Uh, and the second new addition to the Connect families uh, is the Wealth Management Connect, under which the uh, high net worth in the individuals in the mainland can invest in the wealth products that's actually available in Hong Kong. And it's the, again, it's the first time that mainland private, private uh, wealth can flow out to invest in global wealth products through Hong Kong. And likewise, uh, in the reverse direction, Hong Kong uh, 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 wealth can also invest in the uh, mainland wealth products that are manufactured in the, uh, in the, in the Grey Bay area. So with these two new um, Connect uh, schemes, uh, we believe that it, they will create even more opportunities for both the banks here and also other financial intermediaries, especially the asset managers. And the demand for all these Connect schemes have been uh, very significant and in, in fact, continuing to uh, increase in the last two years, despite all that's been happening. Uh, and uh, by now you, you can see that for the bond Connect, it accounts for about 60% of the bond inflows into the mainland bond market by international investors. And about two thirds of all the inflows by international investors going into uh, China's stock market comes through the uh, Stock Connect here. And the numbers for these two Connect schemes are also increasing uh, quite significantly coming into this year. So uh, I do expect that uh, this trend will continue in the coming few years. Uh, and again, this will create opportunities uh, for 
uh, for, uh, for uh, financial uh, institutions. And one thing to note is that with the various connect schemes that I talked about, it's not really just about international investors going into mainland capital market, which has been actually expedited by the inclusion of the mainland assets into different global indexes. But it's also about at least starting to be about uh, mainland capital flowing out into the global uh, markets. For example, I talk about mainland institutional investors being able to invest in global bonds, uh, Great Bay Area residents being able to invest in global wealth products. And I think this trend of gradual and orderly risk control outflow will continue. And again, this will create uh, opportunities for asset managers and financial intermediaries. And I do expect that uh, the demand will be there because there will be a need for mainland wealth uh, and mainland investors to get diversified. So main China opportunities is one set of the opportunities, but Hong Kong is an international financial center. So I do believe that we need to be at the forefront of the other global trends that's very high on the agenda of the global community. Uh, and there are two here. One is FinTech and the other one is green finance. Uh, on fin let me first talk a bit about FinTech. Uh, in fact, we started the FinTech journey some four or five years ago uh, when we roll out the uh, seven smart banking measures. Uh, and many of these are already in operation. For example, uh, we roll out the faster payment system in Hong Kong just two years ago. And in, in this very short time, we've already got 8.5 million registration in a city with a population of only 7.5 million. Some people have, uh, have, have uh, 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 two or three accounts. Uh, so the penetration rate has been tremendous and very fast as well. Uh, the same with virtual banks. Uh, last year, we rolled out the, the first eight virtual banks in Asia. Uh, and the take up rate uh, in terms of account opening of these virtual banks has been going on very well. Um, and then um, in the beginning of this year, we started to think about, hey, we've already done the seven smart banking measures. What next should be done? And the aim that we have here is to try to get the banks in Hong Kong, whether they're large or small, we hope that they can all adopt technology in their operations so that they can deliver efficient and also fair financial services to all their customers. And eventually we developed that into our FinTech 2025 strategy, uh, which was announced about a month or so ago. And that includes a, quite a broad range of initiatives, including for example, uh, RegTech, uh, we are uh, doing a what we call a tag baseline uh, assessment of the banks, uh, the use of sub tag, uh, et cetera. But we all, in order for banks to be able to deliver those services, we also we know that we need to also build uh, the right infrastructure so that the banks can uh, do their innovation in products and services. And at the center of that new infrastructure, is the data platform that we call the commercial data interchange. Uh, in short, this is a common platform in Hong Kong that we want to build that will allow the banks to access so that with their customer's consent, they can, using one common platform, they can access different data points provided by different sources of data. Whether that you're talking about the trade link, uh, the point of sale terminals, uh, electricity companies, et cetera. So they can use this data to drive some of their credit decisions. So that in future, we do believe that with this infrastructure, with a lot of data points that's included in the platform and banks being able to use it, uh, in future, the credit uh, landscape in Hong Kong could be a lot more data driven than just using collateral. And this hopefully will allow the SMEs to be able to get loans a lot easier and probably cheaper. So that's our, 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 our vision of where we want to go in the next few years. And in that FinTech strategy, of course, we also talk about um, central bank digital currency, which is something that we have been developing uh, for a while. And we can talk more about that uh, if you are interested. Let me now very briefly also turn to uh, green and sustainable finance. Uh, with, we actually started our work some four or five years ago again, but in the last 12, uh, 12, 18 months, because of COVID, 
the whole subject of green finance has gained tremendous momentum uh, in the international markets and also among investors. Uh, but what I want to say uh, at the beginning is that climate change or climate challenge to Asia is actually huge and urgent. Uh, Asia is home to the world's fastest growing economy, but we also account for almost half of the uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we know that uh, some of the world's most populous countries are here. And we also have many low-lying and coastal cities, uh, very crowded ones as well, like Hong Kong, which are subject to uh, very uh, uh, risk of climate change. And in order for Asia to transition, it takes a lot of financial resources. Uh, some of the market estimates suggest that uh, in the next uh, three decades, Asia will need about 66 trillion uh, worth of US dollars worth of uh, investments in order to do the transition. And that's more than any other region in the world. And Hong Kong being an RFC right in the, at the heart of Asia uh, will actually have a special role to play in terms of financial intermediation to allow uh, the needed resources to be channeled uh, to help with this uh, transition to, to green. And we're also neighbor to uh, China. And China has announced their uh, own uh, uh, carbon neutrality target uh, to be neutral by uh, 2060. And this transition, again, requires a lot of financing. And I do think that Hong Kong has also a very special role to play to be the green gateway for China, if you like, uh, in terms of China corporates getting global capital to help with their transition using an international platform. And in order to leverage uh, all these opportunities that might grow from uh, the emergence of green and sustainable finance, uh, we have been focusing our efforts uh, along three areas. Uh, one is to make sure that uh, we provide clear guidance to the financial industry about risk management and disclosure. And here, like many other uh, centers, uh, we have been uh, issuing supervisory guidelines uh, we are doing a pilot stress test, which is actually a learning exercise for both us and also the banks here. Uh, and we also, uh, together with the other regulators, uh, we also jointly announced that the financial institutions in Hong Kong, whether your bank, securities broker, or uh, insurance, agent, uh, insurance company, will have to align with TCFD uh, disclosure by 2025. And I think we are the first in Asia to say that. Uh, the second um, line direction uh, that we are heading uh, towards is to make sure that we put in place the necessary infrastructure uh, and catalysts to allow the sustainable finance ecosystem to develop here. And two main areas that we are looking at is talents, capacity building, uh, and also data, data analytics. Uh, and we have just announced again a few weeks ago that uh, we and the other regulators will jointly create a center for green and sustainable finance in Hong Kong, mainly to do these two things, to train the talents in Hong Kong, to train the practitioners in Hong Kong so that they know what green and sustainable finance is, how to think about risk management, and also to develop a knowledge base to aggregate the data sources that's needed uh, in order for you to do, for example, the stress test, uh, or to you know, assess the risk that's created by certain climate changes. Uh, the data analytics, the tools that needs to be used, it can also be developed. So it's a joint effort, not only by the regulators, but also together with the industry, uh, the scientific institutions here and the academia here. And we're also working with IFC as well uh, in terms of uh, capacity building. And the third area that we are focusing on is to promote uh, awareness and market participation in green finance. Here we're, we're, we're doing it um, on two fronts. Uh, one is to walk the, it's really to walk the talk by making sure that our own reserve management uh, is ESG compliant or is heading towards the ESG area. Uh, and, uh, it, and this will incentivize our partners, the external managers that we use uh, to go uh, towards the ESG roads. Um, the second um, uh, area uh, of work that we have is to help the government to create the ecosystem in Hong Kong by issuing green bonds themselves so that it will serve as a demonstration effect. And it will also, by, by having this process, it will draw the necessary 
ecosystem to Hong Kong, whether you're talking about the DCM specialists, the accounting profession, the reviewers, etc. Uh, the government has already done uh, two tranches of green bond issuance, uh, and they have also increased the uh, issuance size so that in the next few years, the government is thinking about issuing another 100, 175 billion worth, Hong Kong dollars worth of green bonds. It's a lot. Uh, and I think it will attract uh, a vibrant uh, ecosystem here. Uh, and so, you know, with what I've been saying is in the last uh, 15 uh, minutes, I hope you have a good sense of where Hong Kong is, how Hong Kong is faring in terms of our financial system uh, in the last two years when we saw a lot of challenges coming our way. And I also hope that you will have a sense of where Hong Kong will be heading in the next few years, uh, grabbing the opportunities that I talk about in terms of uh, in the areas of China, technology and green finance. So I think I'll stop here and see whether you've got uh, any areas that you would like to discuss more. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much for such a you know cohesive and clear uh, discussion, Eddie. I must say I've always been impressed by the word connect because it's a, a, a simple but clear uh, marketing uh, definition of what's going on there, which is so important for the Hong Kong um, as a financial center, but also important for investors to engage. Um, it does raise the question though, and you've touched on some of this, but you know, it is competitive out there. And I don't think I've ever seen a time where central bankers are being asked to consider, for example, you know, the depth of labor skill or the importance of innovation towards staffing, or as you mentioned, education on sustainability. Um, but it's not just the only area that you have to be competitive. Now, we do have a question here. Somebody said, you, we can travel from Singapore, but we can't travel into Hong Kong. What are you doing about it? I think that's a bit unfair to ask you that question, but it does get <laughs> It, it does get to competition. It does get to the intensity of competition in financial centers with a, such an evolving environment. You've already touched on a few, but what are the top two or three areas where you as the regular central banker have to think about remaining at the competitive edge and, and how are you approaching it to stay there? Well, um, I, I think you're right in that uh, if you want to stay as an international financial center, uh, you really need to make sure that your platform is competitive. Uh, and for Hong Kong, I think, as I, as I mentioned, Hong Kong is very unique uh, being the gateway to China. And obviously, we need to maintain that. But I also think that uh, in order that we can uh, grab all the opportunities that will arise from uh, the, uh, the gradual opening up of China, we need to do several things for the Hong Kong platform. One is that we need to maintain our vibrant and robust ecosystem. As I said, you know, being a competitive international financial center is about ecosystem and opportunities. And I've talked about the opportunities, but maintaining the ecosystem here is very important. Things that you are familiar with, uh, clear regulatory standards, uh, the common law system, uh, bilingual abilities, uh, the talent pool, which we are actually very intense on, on developing, uh, stuff like that. That's the first area that we have to do in, in terms of maintaining this ecosystem. The financial institutions will want to come here. People will want to come here. Uh, the second is that we need to maintain a competitive financial platform or financial infrastructure. And here, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we align with international standards, not only in the usual Basel or ISCO ways, but also, for example, in the green bond area or in the green finance area, if there should be emerging international practice coming up, we need to align with them. Uh, we need to make sure that our payment settlement infrastructure can actually plug in very easily with the international machine of the global institutions. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's no undue uh, impediments that will hinder people's efficiency and sort of the, 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 the easiness of doing business here. Uh, and well, let me quote one example, the, the Bond Connect. Bond Connect is really about international investors uh, getting a channel to invest in Chinese bonds. But seven years ago, international investors can already do that directly onshore. And in fact, when we rolled out the Bond Connect two or three years ago, I was asking the question, hey, you know, people can already do it directly. What was the value add of Hong Kong? 
And eventually, after rolling out the scheme for just two, three years, as I mentioned earlier, 60% of those found uh, investment inflow is coming through Hong Kong instead of doing it direct. The main reason is the, the two that I talked about. The ecosystem is here. You've got a lot of financial analysts, a lot of financial uh, service providers. And also, you know, people can just pull in an application, use the, 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 the global uh, custodian and settlement system, plug into the Hong Kong system, and start trading in just one month's time. It's this kind of efficiency that Hong Kong can offer. I think they can keep Hong Kong competitive uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, in the development of different uh, new areas of opportunities. I know you're also a very thoughtful regulator as well, Eddie, and, and you've seen booms and busts. Are you worried also about, because you've got to compete as a regulator, you've got to stay flexible, and I think that's a competitive advantage that Hong Kong has. Of course, the flip side is, is that it may create behaviors, structures, environments that aren't stable in the long run. And I wouldn't expect you to identify what they may actually be, but are you worried about the coordination of regulation generally to make sure that while you're being competitive, the system itself remains, you know, well-structured and well-regulated? Well, it's got to be. I think the, the, the very well-structured uh, a, a system that's aligned with international standard is the basis of what we have. Uh, this is something that we are very, very uh, 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 focused on in making sure that uh, our regulatory system uh, actually is following the international standard. In fact, we, we are in many of the international standard setting bodies. Uh, I'm where the chairman is in the Basel Committee and actually in the Securities Commission is actually chairing uh, IOSCO. So we all are very well aware of the need for Hong Kong to abide by or even be uh, setting a standard higher than the international standard to make sure that uh, our system is credible, is predictable. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we will do less in development because there's always this regulatory role. But in the HKMA, we also got a facilitator role. And by facilitator, what I mean is actually not by lowering standards or requirements, but by providing common infrastructure that will allow the industry uh, to develop innovative solutions. Things like the data infrastructure that I talk about, things like the faster payment system on which they can, they can build their payment solutions. So these are the areas that uh, we, we thought that we can add value uh, in terms of making sure that uh, we develop while maintaining interna international standards. Yeah, it's interesting, Eddie. I was on a call recently with uh, a group of very um, well-known endowment funds in the US and some crypto people. And it's interesting, the crypto people talk proudly of their lack of re regulatory environment, their creativity, but what they're asking for in the future is more regu regulation in many ways, more clarity, more, more control. So it's a fine balance, isn't it, to stay flexible. It does bring me to uh, digital currencies and um, thanks for alluding to it before. Um, as you'd probably be aware at OMFF, we have the Digital Monetary Institute, which has been enormously successful in the sense of a very large take up of people who are part of it now debating it. And we've had all the major regulators involved. And it shows how important and also how open it, this whole area is for the future trends and directions. How are you thinking through uh, central bank digital currencies, your own role, how you prepare for mm. it, how you think through the major issues as you see them? Well, we actually started to look at uh, central bank digital currency or CBDC uh, back maybe three, four years ago uh, when we were looking at uh, uh, the blockchain technology that's underlying some of the crypto uh, innovations. Uh, we thought that the blockchain technology, the DLT, can actually be a promising solution to some of the longstanding uh, pain points in banking, uh, including, for example, trade finance or cross-border payment. Uh, we thought that there's actually a lot of applications on the wholesale side. So that's why we started uh, our own pilots on CBDC on the wholesale side. Uh, we, had, we started this uh, collaboration project with the Bank of Thailand in 2019 uh, to look at how we can use CBDC to allow uh, cross-border payment to be done more seamlessly and also 
you know, in a real time manner. It's, it's always been a pain point, cross border payment. Uh, so we started this uh, pilot in 2019. Uh, after the phase one prototype uh, is done, uh, we actually have already entered into phase two. Uh, and in phase two, we've drawn in two other central banks to join the pilot. One is People's Bank China, and the other one is the Central Bank of UAE. And we've also invited the BIS to be the overall coordinator of the project. Because we do believe that in time, if it is successful, there is a potential that this can be developed into an, an even broader uh, 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 project. And we will shortly be announcing the results of phase two, uh, which will uh, uh, illustrate the architectural design and also uh, the technical aspects of how cross-border payment can be done through a CBDC corridor network uh, on a 24 seven basis. And if ethics is involved, the ethics can be done on a PVP basis. So basically risk-free real-time cross-border payment. Uh, and I hope that this will be the outcome of the phase two. And then we will enter into phase three under which we will put real transactions into the system. And by now we've already got these changes, stock exchanges of Hong Kong and Thailand joining and also 30 different banks from the four jurisdictions joining. So we've got a lot of commercial operators who will try out phase three. If phase three is successful, then we are really talking about commercialization. And because the architecture is open, uh, we do hope that other central banks and other jurisdictions, when they see the results of these uh, pilots, they can also join in under the coordination of the BIS so that it can truly become a multilateral cross-border payment arrangement. Uh, that's our hope. And hopefully this will solve this longstanding uh, 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 pain point. Um, apart, but apart from this, uh, well, what I thought is very promising, what we call a multi-CBDC uh, bridge uh, project. Uh, we're also starting to think about uh, retail CBDC, which is you know, in, in, in a very short form, whether we should issue uh, e Hong Kong dollar. On that, we have already, again, started uh, a project with the BIS Innovation Hub uh, on what we call Project Aurum, which uh, mainly looks at the technical aspects of how we can issue uh, retail CBDC through a two-tier system through the commercial banks. Uh, and within the HKMA, we, we have also started a study to look at more the uh, policy aspects of issuing an e Hong Kong dollar or retail CBDC. And this, this is actually quite a complex area. We need to think about, for example, uh, what's the use case? Uh, will we step into the commercial banking uh, uh, purview, uh, driving or crowding out certain services uh, that are provided by commercial banks or even threatening their deposit base? Uh, what about privacy versus the need for traceability for AML uh, purposes? What about cybersecurity? Because banknotes with cash, we know that the technology, although it's old school, Yet it's very well proven. But in the new world, when we think about CBDC, are we sure that the cybersecurity, uh, the, uh, the protection of the integrity of those virtual banknotes is as good as the physical banknotes? So there, there are different legal policy questions that we need to look at. Uh, we're very open-minded on this. Uh, and we hope that uh, we have we've given ourselves 12 months to look at this. And we hope that we'll have some sorts of initial thoughts uh, towards the middle of next year uh, that we can share with others. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, many jurisdictions are, are also looking at this uh, very interesting area. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And of course, we have seen in the Digital Monetary Institute where there's a lot of debate and discussion. Um, Eddie, do you find that the banking sector itself is putting thought into this or are they caught into a, in a bit of an innovator's dilemma situation where they've got their model, they've been successful at it, this could be quite a shock to their structures. How does the banking sector interact with you on this? And are you getting good engagement from them in the debate about what the what that future trend could look like? Well, we, we've actually involved the banking sector heavily in our wholesale CBDC project. Uh, as I mentioned, there's already 30 banks that are involved in that uh, cross-border payment project. So they all are aware of what CBDCs are how they can be structured, what the prototypes are like, 
and how they can help in certain wholesale solutions. But retail CBDC is a much more complex issue. Uh, we've just started our own thinking process, but in the next 12 months, we will be engaging with the banks, mainly to talk about several things. Things like, for example, the use case. Uh, the banks are actually the better, uh, uh, in a better uh, situ position to tell us whether they can think about good use cases for the CBDCs or how they think about you know, AML traceability. So we will have a lot more interactions uh, with the banks here in the next 12 months when we start to think about uh, the retail CBDC. Thanks very much. You've clearly put a lot of thought into it. So, you know, thanks for the framework there. I might just go to some questions that we've received. Um, this is a classic regulatory question, which I think all financial centers face. But the question really relates to how you're advising your financial operators in Hong Kong when it comes to conflicting regulations, which are emerging and they have always emerged. Let's, let's be honest, between centers. I know during the previous financial crisis, other centers, or perhaps I shouldn't name them, but there was some regulatory arbitrage going on, regulatory challenges between centers. The question was specifically between say, Chinese regulation, you've got groups following that, you've got groups following US regulation, but I'd broaden that out. I think all the international groups that are working with you have degrees of different types of regulation. How do you help them navigate through that to, to keep Hong Kong competitive and deal with that regulatory challenge? Well, I think the, uh, many of the global financial institutions operating here, uh, they are very experienced uh, institutions uh, and they have a uh, very good handle on how to navigate uh, through the different regulations that they face in the jurisdictions that they operate. Uh, the same in Hong Kong. Uh, in Hong Kong, they will have to uh, look at the uh, regulations and requirements in Hong Kong, uh, but I, I'm sure that they know how to structure uh, their business in order that they can abide by the uh, uh, regulations in Hong Kong while uh, observing the commercial and other uh, operate, operation risks that they may face in other uh, jurisdictions. Great, thanks very much, Eddie. I might bring in David Marsh, who's chairman of Office, as everybody knows. And I think uh, David's probably got a, got a question for you, if you're there, David. Yes, uh, thanks very much, um, Mark. And as I said at the beginning, um, Eddie, we're looking forward to getting into grips with you physically and having proper conversations with you before too long. But here's one about the longer term, uh, which is really the renminbi. You are very close to this. You've been following this uh, for many years. Uh, the renminbi is a long term game. Do you think really in 10 to 20 years, given the size of China and given the pace of its growth, that it will really be a serious challenger to the dollar at that time. And also, what does that mean for the HKMA? Will you continue to have this uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous role vis-a-vis -vis the People's Bank of China? Or will you become, over time, as the renminbi becomes more important, simply subsumed into the People's Bank of China? Well, the second part is easy. Uh, we are guaranteed by the basic law in Hong Kong that there will be two monetary authorities. We will run our own monetary system and Hong Kong MA and the People's Bank of China will be two separate monetary authorities overseeing uh, the, 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 the different jurisdictions. So uh, I, I, I don't think there will be uh, any uh, question about uh, Hong Kong MA being a film or, or, or the role of Hong Kong MA uh, uh, having to change. Um, on the first part of the questions, um, I think that will, with the, uh, uh, you know, currently China is already the second largest economy in the world. Uh, and with the trade relationship that it has, I think it's only natural that RMB will be more widely used uh, in the uh, global markets. Of course, uh, it's market driven. You know, whether people will use RMB more widely in the trade settlement or in the investment, will depend on whether one, uh, they see uh, sufficient, uh, for example, hedging instruments for them to manage the risk, uh, or whether they see sufficient investment products uh, that they can put their RMB into use when they receive it. Uh, so th these are the kind of uh, sort of de developments or market development that are needed to support the wider use of RMB. 
Uh, but in the last two or three years, you can see that uh, the use of or the, the role of RMB in the uh, global capital markets has gradually been rising. Uh, as I mentioned, there are more international investors wanting to hold RMB assets uh, in, uh, you know, as part of their portfolio. There are two reasons for that. Uh, one is that it is actually quite a nice yield pickup. If you compare 10 year CGB with uh, US Treasury, there's still 150, 160 basis point uh, yield pickup. But more importantly, many investors uh, see this as a very good way of diversifying their portfolio because the correlation of the Chinese assets with the traditional assets is almost close to zero. So if you think about portfolio construction, it's actually very beneficial to add some of the Chinese assets into your portfolio to reduce risk and also to raise yield. So we see a lot more uh, investors being interested in the Chinese assets, both in the bond and equities market. And we're also seeing more reserve being invested in, uh, in RMB. So my take is that this trend will continue, whether you're talking about RMB as a store of value, as an investment currency, or RMB for use in trade and investment settlement, this trend will continue, but the pace will depend on the market demand and also depend on how fast and how well we can build the infrastructure and markets and products to support this uh, wider use of R&D. Thanks. I think the first question we received, Eddie, was along similar lines, and I might just ask it uh, verbatim if I could, but you must get asked this from time to time, which is, do you anticipate a linkage of the Hong Kong dollar with the renminbi? Uh, or do you see the central bank digital currency linked or a separate uh, you know, electronic uh, renminbi or some other? I guess people are trying to understand the relationship between the Hong Kong dollar, uh, the renminbi and some of the trends there. Um, how do you answer that? I'm sure you get asked that quite often. Right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, 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 I think it, I should say upfront that we have no intention, no plan to change the Hong Kong dollar link to US dollar. Uh, it's been performing very well through the last 30 odd years, through ups and downs, different financial crises. And I thought it's actually performing particularly well in the last two years, when it's actually a cornerstone for the financial stability in Hong Kong. When I mentioned about the various challenges that we had in the last two years, uh, there's actually not much questions about Hong Kong dollar. And that says a lot about the market confidence in the stability of the Hong Kong dollar or in the continuance of the Hong Kong dollar link. So uh, with that kind of confidence that's embedded in the monetary system, I don't really see any reason uh, to change it. Uh, in terms of the digital uh, uh, currency, uh, you know, again, I think you can separate uh, eCMY from e Hong Kong dollar. But you, you work well. If, if we were to pursue e Hong Kong dollar, I should say that it's still an open question. We have not decided yet. But if we were to go for it, eCMY and e Hong Kong dollar will be two separate currencies. It's very clear in the basic law again that uh, Hong Kong dollar will remain the legal tender here. But what you will see is the increasing cross usage of the two currencies across the border, especially between Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area, where we have a lot of economic and people interactions uh, in a very intimate way. So in future, when China rolls out the, uh, the ECMY uh, uh, scheme, uh, you can imagine that for the miniaturists, the mainland investors coming into Hong Kong, they will be able to use their eCMY wallet to go into the shops of Hong Kong and do their purchases. And likewise, for Hong Kong people, uh, when we get to the Great Bay Area, we should be able to get the e uh, wallet on eCMY quite easily and do, do the, uh, the, uh, the purchases as well. So this cross border use of both uh, RMB and Hong Kong dollar probably will be there uh, in future, but it will remain two separate currencies. The one advantage of getting old, Eddie, is that you remember the crises. And I remember a number of people wanting to bet against the Hong Kong dollar peg. And the only thing I've learned in 40 years is don't bet that it'll break. 
Um, so, you know, and I think that's to the credit of the management of the system and, and frankly, the fortitude of leadership over a long period of time on keeping focused on that. I just did want to ask you about the reserves management. You mentioned about green finance, green uh, bonds, but you're obviously a large reserve manager and investor yourselves. How are you approaching ESG, green finance, sustainability finance, and the management of your own funds? Do you have targets? Do you have, what is your, how's your approach changing that? Well, uh, we actually started our ESG investments back uh, maybe five, six years ago. Uh, the way that we do it is that we weave the uh, ESG elements into our investment process. Instead of allocating a particular bucket that we need to fill uh, for ESG investments. Uh, and the basic principle that we put to all our managers uh, is that if there are two uh, investments that are comparable in the risk adjusted long term return, we will go for the ESG one, uh, as simple as that. Uh, and uh, so we actually started uh, our various investments uh, into the uh, different asset classes uh, in a gradual way. Uh, we started with bonds, which is the easiest one, uh, you know, some four or five years ago. Uh, and in 2020, our investment in uh, green bonds actually doubled the size of uh, 2019. And we are starting to go into social bonds. Uh, in the beginning, I'll, I'll have to say that uh, it's, a, it's a bit difficult because the supply is not enough uh, and the infrastructure is not strong enough. Uh, we can't have a very, very clear way to tell what's green or what's not. Uh, even for the credit scoring that we have, which has incorporated the ESG uh, element, uh, we, when we engage the you know, third party uh, advice on uh, different uh, ESG scoring, on the same corporate, the ESG score that we get from advisor A and B can be quite different. So it is a bit difficult in the, in the, in the beginning, but now uh, the supply is a lot more with the momentum that we saw uh, last year. Uh, and also the uh, infrastructure is a, is a lot better. On the equity side, uh, we actually started uh, investing in ESG uh, index link uh, managers only two years ago. Uh, and partly because the ESG indexes, are, uh, the track record is not long enough. Uh, so we need to see a bit more. Uh, but this year, we will be starting to pull out uh, ESG link active managers. Uh, and we will pull out uh, to those partners, especially those who can also contribute to the ecosystem, the green ecosystem in Hong Kong. So we will be doing more uh, on the ESG equity side. Uh, in the private markets, uh, we've always within uh, the ESG element into our due diligence. It's a standard. Uh, a part of our due diligence, whether we do it ourselves or mostly through uh, third parties, the, the consultants. Uh, and we also require all our general partners uh, and also external fund managers to abide by uh, ESG principles. Uh, so we, we, the, the way that we do it is that we build that into the, all the areas uh, of our investments, whether you're talking about bonds, equities and private equity, uh, instead of uh, assigning a certain bucket uh, leaving the rest to be sort of doing, doing sort of the, 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 the usual work. Uh, and we will be working a bit more on disclosure as well, because we thought that uh, when we now start to ask the banks and other financial institutions to be TCFD aligned by 2025, we'll better make sure that we are as well in order to set an example for the others. So we, are, we have engaged a, 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 an, an advisor uh, to help us look at how we can best disclose uh, our own investments in a way that it is quite a, a difficult balance because unlike sovereign wealth funds, uh, reserve managers tend to be a little more reserved uh, in terms of disclosure. But how we can balance that uh, with the need to, uh, to get people to understand uh, what we do in ESG, uh, this is something that we're, we're looking at. Not surprising, you're at the at the leading edge of it, and uh, I don't think I've ever seen such a an aggressive shift in in investment markets and requirements, which of course is going to have a very interesting effect on potentially causing overvaluation in some of these areas and challenges to get returns at the time that we want to get uh, capital into these markets. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting process. I know John Orchard at Onfer's got a question. I think it's coming out of the Digital Monetary Institute questions that we're hearing. I'll hand over to yourself, John. 
Thanks very much, Mark. Um, hi, uh, Governor Ewan, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you set out uh, very well the considerations uh, that central banks are uh, have in front of them with respect to CBDC uh, and whether um, it's a risk to financial stability uh, or an opportunity on uh, financial inclusion and various other metrics. Uh, one issue facing um, central banks such as yours or indeed uh, uh, the one in the UK, and we spoke to uh, the Bank of Israel yesterday with a similar issue, um, how will you treat stable coins dom denominated in currencies other than your own uh, if they start to proliferate, proliferate among the retail population in Hong Kong? Um, so either in renminbi, say, or or dollars uh, for the UK it would be say euros or dollars. How, how would, you, would you regulate that away or allow it to proliferate? I wondered. Thank you. Well, um, well, it, it's actually a a, a very uh, important issue that's been quite uh, uh, sort of deeply discussed uh, in the central banking circle, uh, and the consensus that we have uh, is that uh, for stable coins to be issued in a certain uh, jurisdiction, uh, there's got to be the right regulatory framework uh, that can help make sure that uh, the stable coins uh, are well regulated, uh, that the, uh, the float is well managed, uh, that the operations won't impose any financial stability risk uh, to, the, to, the, to the jurisdiction. Uh, these, are, these are things that will be needed before any stable coins can be introduced in any jurisdiction. And uh, different places will have different current regulations uh, in order to capture uh, the, uh, the operation of stable coins. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, if they take deposits, then they will fall automatically under the banking ordinance at which we can have a handle. Uh, and we also have uh, a, 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 another uh, ordinance regulating the store value facilities. So if they take, um, uh, money from the public, store the value, facilitate the payment transaction, it will also be caught under the uh, store value uh, facility uh, ordinance. Uh, we are currently reviewing all these ordinances and the latest developments of the stable coin uh, or potential stable coin that can be issued and see whether there are gaps that we need to fill. And if there are, what's the best way of uh, filling it? Uh, whether we should expand the current uh, regulations or even whether we should have a new regulatory mechanism uh, for stable coins or other crypto uh, assets. Uh, and this is something that we are uh, looking at. Uh, I understand that in UK and uh, one or two other jurisdictions, uh, some market cons consultations is already underway uh, and we can make reference uh, to that as well. Uh, but the important point which is common to uh, different regulators is that uh, there's got to be the right regulatory framework and environment uh, for uh, uh, stable coins or similar schemes to operate because they do interact with the public and they do take uh, some of the public's investments uh, into uh, their schemes. Uh, so, so that's the kind of broad approach uh, that we have. You're just proving once again, Eddie, how challenging central banking is uh, with all the changes. And we hear actively that central banks, while staffed with excellent people, are continuing to struggle to get depth of skill uh, because of the dramatic changes that are going on. Um, we talked about technology, fintech, the attraction of fintech to Hong Kong. I just want to ask a sort of a back and fill question. Um, I happen to be at something separate from OMFF, but a CEO of a global uh, financial institution, very well regarded came into a round table and said he's very worried about his cyber risk. Um, and it was a very kind of revelatory sort of conversation. Uh, and I think he means that in many ways. You know, we talk about cyber risk in geopolitical terms sometimes. I think that's incorrect. I think it's a, a broad issue. Um, but I think the issue, the question I wanted to ask you was specifically, you know, the banking sector has to upgrade its systems. It has to spend money on what doesn't really add much to the growth in the future, but protects the system. Um, what's your own interpretation of how you're keeping, as a regulator, the financial system focused also on backing and filling to keep up with the technological challenges that we see, maybe from cyber, maybe from systems that are just aging, et cetera? Do you have a sort of a, a view on that particular challenge? Well, that, that's very important because um, when we are pushing for the um, use of the technology in banking operations, uh, 
On the other hand, on the regulatory side, they are actually very focused on the various technology risks uh, that this will pose on the uh, banks and make sure that they will have the ability to manage those risks. So the, 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 there is a bit of division of labor uh, in our place in that there is a wing that is responsible for development, for creating the infrastructure, for pushing banks to uh, uh, create innovative products. But on the regulatory side, they look a lot more on the issues that you talk about, uh, cybersecurity, uh, outsourcing to third parties, are they secure, data security, uh, stuff like that. And on cybersecurity in particular, we actually, uh, uh, the, the first uh, area of work that we have under the smart banking uh, initiative is actually we introduce a cybersecurity, what we call cybersecurity fortification initiative, requiring all banks to have a very in-depth assessment of their cybersecurity, of their resources, of whether they can safeguard the system uh, using consultants trying to penetrate and identify areas of weaknesses. We actually did that before we roll out the other smart banking initiative, because we know very well that, as you say, uh, if you have a system that's in, or if you have a financial system that's increasingly going digital in terms of products and services, the basic foundation, the, it, it, it is important that you are able to protect them from attacks. Uh, and cybersecurity skills and resources uh, will be important. And of course, the other technology risks are there. Uh, failure of the system, uh, whether you have maintenance, these are things that are actually in the uh, regular uh, thematic examination that we have uh, with banks, we will examine them. But the third area that I, would, I should emphasize uh, also uh, is that when you introduce technology, uh, what we want to do is to provide early guidance to banks on areas that they need to watch out when they apply technology. Uh, one uh, clear area is artificial intelligence. Uh, while we are driving the banks to use AI data analytics to do, the, to do a bit more data-driven uh, credit scoring or credit allocation uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the borrowers, what we want to avoid is creating systematic unfairness in the system in that certain people or certain categories of people will be prejudiced in a systematic way by the machines. So we emphasize that there's got to be human intervention. There's got to be governance over how you use AI. There's got to be mechanisms that will ensure that there won't be this kind of unfairness uh, not knowingly uh, being built into the use of technology. So uh, we, we're actually quite uh, 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 divided in our allocation of work. One wing is responsible for pushing for technology, being creative, trying out everything. The other wing is actually pulling them back to say, hey, have you seen all the rest? So uh, that's, that's the approach that I thought will be a lot more prudent uh, going forward when we think about uh, the further push of technology for the banking sector. Thanks very much, Eddie. We, we're almost out of time. It was interesting that CEO of the large financial institution spent 20% of the time talking of cyber risk. 80% of the presentation was about how he's increasing his digital footprint to stay competitive. And I've never seen a CEO drive towards risk faster, having identified at the start. It is a real challenge for everybody on how to to balance this development, be at the cutting edge of growth while also managing the risks. That was a really fulsome uh, um, answer, which I think is indicative that you've had great training across the bank and seen all aspects. I might just ask you a last question if I could, um, because I think we've now uh, completed the questions online. Um, if central banking has been asked to do an enormous array, array of things, and my career, frankly, has been propped up by central banks having to intervene, bail the system out, you know, we've had another bout, a route of last year, and I think the global system actually responded, you know, fantastically well, perhaps because the financial crisis taught us some lessons. And, and we really did avoid, you know, some pretty sticky moments there last March. Just generally your observation on central banking more broadly, are we asking too much of central bankers? Um, you know, how, do, how should would they be thinking about managing the environment going forward as central bankers? 
Um, you know, wh where are we at on on the role of central banking in your, in your own mind? If, you, if you're happy just to comment briefly on it. Well, I, I think um, what uh, what was done uh, at the beginning of COVID in March last year was actually the right course of action uh, for central banks in terms of uh, easing monetary conditions, uh, creating accommodative uh, environment for the corporates and for the economy, uh, providing targeted support uh, for the sectors that are hit by COVID. Uh, in any case, COVID is actually an, an unprecedented global shock that we have not seen before. We have not seen the economy shutting down like that. So I would say that uh, the very accommodative stance for, of central banks around the world uh, is very necessary in order to protect the global economy from collapsing and to protect the global financial markets from overcorrecting. So uh, that one, I, I, I'm actually have, I actually have no doubt about it. But in the central bank toolbox, uh, I think we need a bit more than just monetary policy. Uh, we talk a lot more about macro potential policies these days because one side effect, potential side effect of accommodative monetary policy for a long time is asset inflation or financial imbalances that we might be seeing in the financial markets but very often they show up in the property market. So in the toolbox of the central banks, uh, it will be necessary for us to have the right tools uh, in order to calibrate some of these imbalances so that uh, they won't really sort of suddenly uh, come in to hurt the recovery of, of the financial markets. So I, I, I thought having different tools and deploying them uh, for different purposes and also preparing uh, for the eventual withdrawal of some of these accommodative measures, uh, giving the right signals and communicating well with the markets. Uh, these are all essential areas uh, that uh, central banks should do and should prepare for. There are certain things that it might be a lot more difficult for central banks to do and probably easier for fiscal policy to perform the role uh, which involve, for example, uh, addressing inequality, how to make sure that there could be income redistribution uh, to reduce the inequality that some say that might be created by the very easy monetary uh, conditions. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the support that has to be given to SMEs and certain sectors, probably fiscal measures or targeted fiscal measures uh, will be more effective in those areas. So, my take is that one, you need a, a fuller toolbox to deal with the very complex situation that we're in. And second, a good coordination uh, with the fiscal authority to make sure that monetary and fiscal policies are well coordinated to maximize the, uh, the outcome by the use of these uh, different tools. Thanks for that full answer, Eddie. I, I think at Jackson Hole in 2019, and my interpretation was that the central banking community started to talk about fiscal more. I know Governor Phil Lowe in Australia had, and, and that's not easy to make that transition of discussion when you've got independence, but I think it was recognition of where the tool set uh, resides, and it's fabulous to hear you talking about it. I do think we're asking too much of central banks, but uh, we should also celebrate the great work the central bankers have done. Let's, let's be honest, we could have had at least two major problems in the last 15 or 16 years um, without really clear thinking by central bankers. Uh, and then again, today we've heard from you clear thinking, not just on central banking, but on strategy as a financial center, strategy for employment. One of the questions here was, you know, what university should I go to in Hong Kong to get sustainability <laughs> finance education? Uh, I didn't ask you that, you might just throw that out there, um, but it does show that you've got people's imagination. And I, I see this with young people, we see this with our own Sustainability Institute it's fabulous that you're stimulating thinking on along those lines. So thanks very much for engaging with OMFIF. We're about thinking through the issues and, you know, with your leadership. And I might just hand back to David. I think he's probably got a word to say as well of thanks. Well, yes, indeed. Um, Eddie, you are a bit of a veteran. You're a survivor of this scene. Um, well done for getting through the last two or three pretty fraught years. There's going to be big challenges ahead. We know all that, the whole China-United States relationship is astonishingly many-sided. In Germany, where I am now, if the Greens do get into government after the September elections, then of course that will also bring some strains with the German 
China relationship, but I think all the things you've told us about are really quite universal truths that central banks all around the world are looking at. There's an astonishing commonality of purpose, uh, whether you're in Asia or in Europe or in parts of the Americas. So we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Many thanks, Mark, for taking us through all this. Thank you for everybody who's been on the line, um, getting our questions in there. And, and we look forward to the next steps. So we are also uh, looking forward to a good long-term relationship with Hong Kong, China, as it evolves in the next 10 to 20 years. So we look forward to carrying on that journey together. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you all. All the best. Bye-bye. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.